तदांगीरामकृष्ण जगद्गुर पादपद्मीतोश्वा प्रणमा मुहूर्मु आज के शुभेंदु विकास पूर्वकाश तो स्मारक बक्तृता शुभेंदु विकास जन्मग्रहण करें पयला पयला अक्टोबर उन्नीसश ऊनत ख्रीटाब्दे अधुना बांगलेश श्रीहट्ट जिल में मात्र तेईस बचर बस पितृहारा हुए संसार सब दायित्व और करतव्य भार ग्रहण करें और आजीवन अकृतदार से करतव्य सूषु भावे पालन करें केंद्रीय सरकार अधीने उच्च पदे छें और कर्मक्षेत्रे चारित्रिक साधुता दक्षता और परोपकार प्रभृति सकल प्रिय प्रभृतर जो सकल प्रिय पत्र छें अन्या संगे कपोष करें अल्प बस रामकृष्ण मठ मिशन प्रति श्रद्धाशील और ठाकुर माँ स्वामीजी आदर्श उद्बुद्ध हुई जीवन काटिए सारा जीवन अर्जित अर्थ सब ही परहितकर प्रतिष्ठान दान कर दरदी मन दिए आत्मय बंधु परिचित अपरिचित सकल विपदे सहाज्य हाथ बाड़िए दिए अकृपण एवं निस्वार्थ भाव अवसरप्राप्त एकक जीवन काटिए सद्रंथ पाठ कर छोट बड़ सकल के तर दरजी मन दिए सहाज्य कर पाँच अक्टोबर दूहजार उन्नीस ठाकुर मायर चरण स्थान पे वक्तृत्व तरी भागने डाक्त अनबाण होम चौधरी और दिल्ली एक बड़ो हस्पिटाले बड़ पोस्टे आ तरी पृष्ठपोषकता आयोजित अनबाण हमारे छात्र रणरंदपुर आज के शुभेंदु विकास पूर्वक आयस्त स्मारक बक्तृता देवें श्रीमती श्रमणा मित्र सीईओ वन एम बन एम वन एम मान मिलियन वन मिलियन बन मिलियन इंटरेस्टिंग अर्गानाइजेशन सीईओ सी उड बी स्पीकिंग ऑन इंडिया प्रसपेक्ट इन द एज अफ ए आई मैंने आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस श्रमण मित्र फादर एंड मदार द पेरेंट्स आर प्रेजेंट ओवर हियर एंड श्रमण मित्र श्रीमती श्रमण मित्र शी बिलंगस टू ए भेरि एरिस्टिकोटिक फैमिली फैमिली अफ रमेश मित्र सर रमेश मित्र राजार हाट रमेश मित्र जी वज कजिन अफ स्वामी निरंजनानंद जी निरंजन घोष एंड रमेश मित्र देव मामा मामा तो भाई दादा पिस्त तो दादा दिस वे सो शी कम्स अफ ए भेरि रेसपेक्टेबल फैमिली अफ बेंगल अबियलि शी हेज बीन प्रिपेयरिंग हार सेल्फ फर सोसाइटी फ्रम द भेरि बिगिनिंग अफ हर से एडल्टुड एंड हिज पेरेंट्स प्रोवाइडेड हर उथ अल सर्ट्स अफ फेसिलिटीज सी इज न वार्किंग इन यूएस डूंग एक्सलेंट जब थ्रू हिज अर्गनइजेशन वन एम बै वन एम इनफैक्ट शी हेज पिकड अप द टपिक इट सेल्फ India's prospect in the age of AI. I would request first uh, Sri Shakti Prasad Mishra, the Nivedita Chair of our Institute, to introduce more elaborately the speaker to the audience. Please do come over.
topic itself is pretty interesting and uh, definitely we are curious to know about artificial intelligence and there is much apprehension and fears regarding artificial intelligence. Many say there is a jobs nature and it is also said that uh, by the time today's uh, college goers go to job market, 47% of uh, prevalent jobs will have vanished. So there is much apprehension about it, whether it's a job snatcher or job creator, we will hear from the prominent speaker, uh, who is a well-known figure. So he is the founder and CEO of One Million by One Million, a global virtual accelerator that aims to help one million entrepreneurs globally to reach one million dollar in revenue and beyond. So he's a Silicon Valley based entrepreneur and strategy consultant. She writes the blog Sramana Mitra on strategy and is author of the Entrepreneur Journey book series. As an entrepreneur CEO, she ran three companies, Days, Interka, and Umma. Sramana has a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2015 and she was named one of uh, LinkedIn's top 10 influencers. And uh, she would love for this to be an interactive experience before attending. Uh, we request you might listen to her previous uh, institute talks that are available on YouTube. And we are really pretty curious to hear a lot about uh, this topic, which is burning. Many say that it's going to be, 21st century is going to be an age of artificial intelligence. Okay, please start your talk. Uh, wherever you feel comfortable. test it's a real pleasure for me to return to this forum after four years thank you very much Maharaj for having me over over again over and over again history is evolving rather quickly at the moment. Since I was last here, we've experienced a once in a century pandemic. Russia has started an unprovoked war against Ukraine, putting the world on the brink of nuclear threat. By challenging the legitimacy of perfectly conducted elections, various political leaders are playing with destroying democracies around the world, including in America. Simultaneously, artificial intelligence, the subject of my talk today, has burst into the forefront of popular consciousness with the advent of generative AI, large language models, chat GPT, and so on. All this sounds like jargons to you. They are. You don't need to worry about it for this evening. For the moment, just let's work with the the terminology of artificial intelligence, if you have questions, I will answer them as we go along. Today I will explore a lot of complex issues. My recommendation is that you pull out your mobile phones, silence them, but keep your online notepad handy. Otherwise, you will not remember what I'm talking about at the beginning of the talk by the end of the talk. <laughs> so we wouldn't be able to have a very interactive Q&A if you don't remember. I had a hard time pulling together so many important planet scale problems in one place in a succinct way. I will do my best, but please take some notes so we have a really vibrant Q&A session. When I first spoke here in 2016, I spoke on the future of capitalism. 
I discussed how mass scale automation engineered by artificial intelligence stands to render human beings useless with nothing to do, with no mechanism to earn a livelihood. The economic impact of AI on society was my primary concern. My general conclusion was that we need universal basic income, a form of economic redistribution to keep society from spinning out of control. The basic premise of universal basic income is that all human beings are given a stipend by the government, even when they cannot be employed. The rationale is that if jobs become scarce, society can still have a reasonable, stable method of operating without spinning into chaos, especially social unrest and crime. This conclusion is now by and large an accepted remedy in a world that is about to go through extensive automation. Economists have come to some degree of consensus that UBI will increasingly become necessary. However, it is likely to take a couple of decades to fully infiltrate society. So we are not quite going to a post-work world immediately. A post-work world is coming. It is inevitable. But we still have a bit of time. In my second talk in 2019, I spoke about man and Superman, the impact of how AI-driven augmentation of the human species will render one part of civilization, man, extinct. The other part, the part that becomes enhanced by AI, will thrive. This enhanced Superman will compose music like Beethoven, write poetry like Tagore, make scientific discoveries like Einstein, and so on. This too is becoming a consens consensus prediction in intellectual circles today. Man is going to become AI enhanced. Human capacity is going to be drastically improved with the use of AI. Do we still consider this AI enhanced species, mankind? Maybe not, but that's beside the point. This enhanced organism is the direction in which evolution is taking us. This is the future of artificial intelligence. There will be Superman in not too distant a future. Now, I stand before you in 2023, the world has evolved, AI has quickened pace. There is both good news and bad news in that quickening of technological advancement. Let us start with the good news. India has leapfrogged to an extremely positive strategic position. Some of this is due to the movements in geopolitics. American hegemony has ended. China has emerged as a parallel power with imperialistic ambitions. The West wants India on its side to counterbalance China. A lot of India's prospects, however, are due to its technological capability. And artificial intelligence sits at the heart of that know-how. World-class technology companies with AI expertise are now emerging out of India and selling products and services on a global scale. One such, Cure.ai, offers a product that can analyze chest x-rays at lightning speed and screen for TB, for example, or any kind of lung disease. I spoke with the CEO, Prashant Warrior, recently. He told me, and I quote, chest x-ray is the most common imaging modality. There are about 1.3 billion chest x-rays taken every year around the world. 
If you look at India, for example, most x-rays are not reported by radiologists. There is a super high volume, and radiologists are busy with their CT scans, MRIs, and ultrasounds. They don't have time to deal with x-rays. Similarly, if you look at most geographies, x-rays are not reported well or not reported at all. Error rate is anywhere between 20% to 23%. It's a very basic modality. X-rays came in the 1800s. It's old, it's cheap. X-ray is still valuable, but with the increasing volume, radiologists don't have the time to interpret that. This is a perfect use case for AI. How do we automate X-ray reporting? The hypothesis for Cure.AI was to make X-ray reporting similar to pathology reporting. Pathology reporting used to be done manually in the 80s. You used to count the number of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets using a microscope. It became fully automated in the 2000s when machines came in. Cure.ai wanted to get X-ray reporting to the point where you can rely on a machine to give you the report. Technology is very close to that. Cure.ai found their first customer in the Philippines. This customer was running TB screening. They had four mobile vans. There are a lot of rotary people here. You would resonate with this, uh, this case study. They had four mobile vans. These vans had an X-ray system inside the van. They would start from Manila and travel around the country for about two weeks. Then they would come back to Manila. Every day, they screened about 200 to 300 people. Let's say 1,400 in a week. They had many X-rays. There was no radiologist in the van. They collected the X-rays at the end of two weeks and then sent them out for interpretation. Back in 2018, it took them four to five weeks to get those x-rays read. A patient who came in on day one would get the result four weeks later. That patient was already gone and had started some treatment or the other. Cure.ai technology, this is Indian technology, an Indian company has built this technology, could get this report in one minute. Four to five weeks versus one minute, this is the beauty of AI. And this technology has been developed by an Indian company. Now 600 to 700 hospitals around the world are using this product. Tuberculosis is still rampant in the more resource-constrained areas of the world, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, so on. There are about 10 million to 11 million TB cases every year. It's still a problem. A lot of people still die from TB. So here, we have Indian AI technology addressing a big medical problem and having a huge impact. Cure.ai also offers a stroke care product that can quickly assess the need for different categories of intervention within five minutes, saving lives, saving money, making healthcare fast and scalable. Chest x-rays have a high volume. Head CT scan, for example, requires speed. AI can manage volume and speed. Head CTs are taken when you're looking at critical cases. When you want to do something quickly, you do a CT. You need a fast interpretation. For a stroke patient, every minute that goes by, brain cells are dying. You want to intervene quickly. Intervention is sometimes slow, especially at night because radiologists are not available. But why wait? Why not use AI to interpret these scans? The use cases are simple. There are two kinds of treatments for stroke. One is thrombolytic and the other is thrombectomy. Thrombolytic is when you administer an anticoagulant which will dissolve the clot in the brain. If you administer it to someone who has a bleed, their bleed will worsen, it will be fatal. You want to rule out a bleed so you can administer that thrombolytic agent. That is what AI is able to do within a minute. 
just quickly figure out whether this is what they should do. Second is to perform a thrombectomy, and for that you need to look at a larger area in the brain. This is also something AI can do and with great speed. These are just a few examples from a single company in India. There's a tremendous amount of work going on in AI-driven healthcare from drug discovery to diagnostic imaging to personalized medicine to robotic surgery. We've just seen successful vaccine development for COVID take place within a year. This is accelerating even further. Most experts believe that the COVID pandemic is not the last one we will see. So it's good to know that humanity will have AI to help cope with future pandemics and have rapid vaccine development technology on hand when we get hit again with another virus. All this makes me tremendously optimistic about the possibilities of caring for 1.5 billion people in India and 10 billion human beings on our planet. We are going to 10 billion population in the upcoming decades. Indian technologists and entrepreneurs are going to play a very big role in both. We will, within a couple of decades, arrive at a point where even the most remote parts of the planet are well served by modern medicine. There will be AI doctors and AI surgeons administering new drugs and treatments invented by AI algorithms. Medicine, today a privilege of those who can afford, can become universally available as a democratic right of all human beings. And this can happen within a couple of decades. All this is gonna move really, really fast. A parallel revolution will take place in education. Today, the world struggles with finding good teachers to educate children. Children, young adults, even adults, because so much is changing and continuous education is essential to staying on top of one's profession. We're definitely moving towards AI-enabled personalized tutoring at all levels now. All students, even those who are below average, with the help of personalized tutoring, will perform at an above average level. And because this is also a technology-driven solution, it is completely scalable. This is not restricted to one or two people. You know, millions and millions of students can use personalized tutoring. You don't understand how to solve an algebra equation? No problem, here. Your AI tutor can work with you for half an hour and give you personalized practice. By the time the tutoring session is over, your confidence and self-esteem would have skyrocketed. You don't speak English? Okay, let's do the session in Mingoli. No problem. Oh, and you want to learn English? Your AI tutor will also take care of that. All this can also happen in the next couple of decades. In fact, Maharaj, Ramakrishna Mission schools and hospitals should put in place a comprehensive AI strategy in collaboration with the technology companies working on these problems. This is directly relevant to your work. Now, in parallel with advances in healthcare and education, AI transplants and human augmentation technology will also advance. Gene editing technology will advance. Many diseases and illnesses will be edited out at the gene level. Down syndrome, for example, can be edited out at the gene level. Schizophrenia can be ed edited out at the gene level. Most importantly, Humanity's fast path into supermanhood will accelerate. Let's say around 2050, human history will start to bifurcate into man and superman. This was the topic of my last talk here. If you haven't, if this topic interests you, you can check it out on YouTube. There is a moral question. 
we must contend with in this evolution. Who gets to upgrade to Superman? And who gets left behind as man? Man will become extinct. So the ethical answer to this question is, humanity must find a way to upgrade all 10 billion humans on the planet to Superman. No one must get left behind. Now, if you're like me, you're wondering, how do we afford all this? Great, AI doctors, AI surgeons, AI tutors can infiltrate society, but who pays for all this? For all this technology, how would the economics of AI-driven education and healthcare work? And who pays for 10 billion people to be upgraded to Superman? The answer to this question takes us back to my 2016 talk on the future of capitalism. Do you remember that I predicted that capitalism will be dead in the face of a society run by AI? I stand by that conclusion. There is going to be an enormous boost in productivity in large enterprises with the insertion of AI into every function from manufacturing to logistics to construction to financial services. This is going to yield immense profits. But these profits are going to be generated by machines, not human beings. Human beings are no longer going to be necessary. Human beings will not have jobs. Therefore, those profits would have to be taxed heavily to offer large-scale societal benefits. This is socialism. This is redistribution. And it will have to happen. Otherwise, there will be social unrest, there will be crime. If I had any doubt about the future of capitalism in 2016 or 2019, in 2023, I have none. Capitalism will be dead. The time has come for socialism. Otherwise, society will spin out of control. Note one thing, however. There is a difference between socialism and communism. In communism, the state takes away the rights of free press, individual property rights, freedom of speech, etc., that are all important tenets of democracy. Socialism offers universal education, universal health care, even universal basic income, but does not withdraw individual rights. And it certainly does not destroy democracy. Unfortunately, in 2023, survival of democracy can no longer be taken for granted. Whether it is communism or fascism, democracy is under threat. Does AI aid this threat, or can it hinder its nefarious progress? Let us contemplate that issue. The primary tool of politics is the narrative, the story. For example, Donald Trump's declaration that the American election was stolen from him is a story. And he has successfully peddled this to the American electorate. Unfortunately, AI has put unprecedented capacity in the hands of politicians to distribute whatever garbage narrative they wish to propagate. Whatever hate they want to fan, and with this extraordinary capacity, propaganda machines are actively destroying balanced centrist societies, replacing them with extremist populist masses whose general state of being is anger and hatred. Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, YouTube are each full of propaganda and they will continue to be so. There is no way of checking this. AI gives these platforms great ability to galvanize large masses of people around simplistic storylines. 
So from the benevolent prospects of AI like universal education and universal healthcare, we have arrived at the prospect of communism and fascism and death of democracy. Unfortunately, India is not immune to this threat. The other dangerous, dangerous prospect is the threat of war. As we can see, conflict between sovereign nations is suddenly back with a vengeance. The Russia-Ukraine war is still happening in somewhat old-fashioned ways. Drones are the extent of AI truly in action right now. But in the upcoming decades, war is also going to change into AI warfare. A sovereign nation wanting to wield power over another can use AI to destroy a banking system or a power grid, or in India, Aadhaar, for instance. How is India going to defend itself if such an attack is launched by another foreign power? AI warfare has two aspects, offense and defense. India has thus far not been an offensive country. It doesn't go around attacking neighbors to gain territory, but India's neighbors tend not to be as benign. For decades, India has learned to coexist with a nuclear power across its border. Within reason, all nations have behaved with restraint. But AI is a different animal. While nuclear technology is expensive and esoteric, and only very few know how it works, AI is widespread. In the upcoming decades, it will become even more widespread, even more democratized in access and in usability. And then everyone, from little terrorist organizations to entire sovereign nations, would be tempted to play with it. This is a real danger. And unlike nuclear disarmament, AI disarmament is an unlikely scenario. There is a lot of talk right now about regulating AI. It's a complex topic. Governments are not AI experts. How to regulate is not very easy for them to figure out. Many thought leaders also worry about a superior intelligence coming into being and what that would do on its own. You know, Superman is really intelligent. And Superman, AI enhanced Superman has a mind of its, his own, her own. So what is that superior intelligence going to do? This is, you know, is humanity creating a Frankenstein-like monster that we could lose control over? This is certainly a concern in the long run, and uh, it's being discussed quite a lot. Uh, there's no good answer to this yet. And uh, there's, a, there's a school of thought that thinks there is no answer to this question. We'll find out. Humanity may destroy itself by, with this evolution, this development in evolution. In the short term, however, AI in the hands of bad actors is a bigger and more immediate concern. And this is, this concern is current. The Superman spinning out of control concern is later. The bad actors concern is immediate. Evil exists. Without wandering into theology, we have to acknowledge that evil exists. And evil will do evil with AI. Before I switch to another major topic, I want to address an inevitability that we are headed towards. It is something I expressed concern about in my 2016 talk. A post-work society is about to become reality by mid-century. How do we function in that world order? 
Let us assume the best case scenario of universal basic income, universal education, universal health care, universal artificial augmentation once that becomes available. In other words, universal species level enhancement from man to superman, 10 billion superhumans roaming the planet by the end of this century. I don't think this is going to happen. <laughs> Practically speaking, this is not going to happen. But in this thought experiment, let us assume that it does happen. But Superman has to exist for the most part in a post-work society. Work is no longer going to take up 8 to 10 hours of the day. What is Superman going to do? And now we need to enter the realm of history, anthropology, and philosophy to look for answers. In the beginning of time, man hunted and gathered. Man sat around the fire telling stories. Man sang, man danced. On the walls of caves, man drew pictures. The beginning of civilization was, man, was when man stopped to take care of fellow human beings. As civilization progressed, as property rights emerged, as the concept of money emerged, man's desire for status increased. Man was no longer content with drawing on cave walls in private. Man wanted to hang paintings on museum galleries. Man was no longer content by telling stories to fellow tribe members. Man wanted to write books that sold millions of copies. Simple, collaborative, tribal society structures fell away. Aggressive, competitive, globalized world orders emerged. Work became a key tool in this intensely competitive world order. Fooled by intense ambition for excess, man forgot the pleasure of community, family, friends, dance, storytelling, took a backseat as work became the dominant force in society. The post-work world order will offer us an opportunity to return to simpler values that offer very serious returns. Is Superman going to be driven by status and excess? Or is Superman going to pay attention to being present in the moment, enjoy the sublime beauty of roses, the taste of delicious home-cooked food, the pleasure of painting without the need for external validation by critics? Will Superman dance? The reason I ask these apparently silly questions is as follows. AI can create art. AI can compose music. Whether or not a superhuman being can compose music like Beethoven or paint like Van Gogh, AI can certainly do both. In that scenario, what is the value of human-generated music or art? And do you need Einstein-level intelligence in a physicist to come up with advanced scientific discovery? AI may be better at it. I happen to also be a painter. When I was growing up here in Kolkata, I used to come here to Gold Park to the home of my teacher, my Master Moshe, Sri Ramananda Bandhapadhyay, every Saturday morning and paint for three hours. To me, painting is a spiritual process. I don't paint to gain recognition. I paint because I enjoy the feeling of color and brush, and what happens when paper, on paper when I pick up my brush and apply paint to it. It is a deeply visceral, organic process, a form of meditation. I know from my many conversations with Ramananda Babu that he also views painting in the same way. Yes, he has gained recognition as an artist, but his primary motivation is 
that spiritual process. And this is my conclusion about AI-generated art, music, poetry, and literature. AI can do something mechanically. Human beings experience the same creative process as a spiritual endeavor, something that AI cannot take away. This, and thus, in post-white work society, the spirituality of aesthetics, of creativity, of painting, singing, playing the piano, will still remain a source of pleasure, joy, transcendence. Notice, I have not mentioned dance yet. That is because dance falls in a category of even greater power and importance. Dance is movement. Movement is good for well-being. Dancing to music requires the brain to function with great agility. This kind of mental agility is excellent for mental well-being, including for aging. Dancing with another person or a group of people has even more benefits of connection and community. And all this is outside of the reach of artificial intelligence. Robots can dance all they want. Makes no difference. Man and Superman will also dance. In a post-work society, I believe dance should be placed at the center of societal structure. Just like our ancestors danced when they assembled around the fire before human life started to become complicated, Man and Superman should dance. And I assume that by now, you can tell that I'm an avid dancer. Next, we're going to have to deal with a subject that threatens India's otherwise bright prospects in the 21st century, climate change. You are all acutely aware of the intense heat India is experiencing. There are also acute water problems on the horizon. The Gangotri Glacier is melting. On water, I have long been of the opinion that India's long coastline needs to be densely populated with water desalination plants. While it is an expensive solution in the grand scheme of things, it is also the most obvious solution. In a sense, it is a low-hanging fruit. Seawater and can and should be transformed into drinkable water. It has to happen. India has a very long coastline, so this is definitely doable. And then AI can be used to distribute water efficiently, make sure leakages are automatically fixed. Today, there's a lot of water wastage that happens all over India because pipes leak and you know taps leak and so on, faucets are open. But AI can be you know, installed to fix all of that. So AI can enhance the overall efficiency of water supply and distribution in India. And all that is going to have enormous impact on, on the water problem. On heat, also there are many applications of AI on the horizon. These are benevolent applications from smart buildings, green buildings, clean energy, smart grids for distributing power. Uh, in commercial, industrial, residential real estate, AI will play a very big role to achieve efficiency, control emissions, and improve sustainability. Policy level interventions need to drive India starting now. We don't have time to waste. Cars, of course, are a huge contributor to the climate crisis. Unfortunately, India has encouraged car ownership at a massive scale. In this era of ride sharing, why do people need to buy so many cars of their own? Why can't we design a society with far fewer cars on the streets, far better public transportation, ride sharing, and incentives for using them? There are stark consequences to India's inability to manage the climate crisis. And if the climate crisis is allowed to unravel unchecked, then we will have far fewer of the species of man 
left to upgrade to Superman. People are going to die. If temper temperature increases continue unchecked, hundreds of millions of people are going to die. We don't want that. India has to get its act together and design good policy so that a billion people do not get wiped out of the face of this earth. That brings me to the role of policy in general and to AI policy in particular. The problem the West is trying to get its arm around right now is how to design AI policy that doesn't hinder the development of benevolent AI. I've ex discussed a lot of benevolent AI use cases. AI could give us tremendous benefits. So we need to continue to develop AI. We shouldn't stop the enormous progress in the AI development, but we, does, we do need to slow things down and check the proliferation of destructive AI. But this is a very complex problem to solve. That balancing act is incredibly complicated. As I said earlier, AI is abundantly available right now and expertise is being acquired rapidly and democratically. An online education platform called Udemy has some 8 million people learning AI programming as we speak. Large platforms like OpenAI, Microsoft Azure, Amazon AWS, Google Cloud are all building AI capabilities and easy to use programming tools to accelerate this democratization. It is going to be very hard to control what people do with this capability. In addition, People with superior AI knowledge do not really work for governments. Governments have very low levels of understanding of AI in general, and thus they cannot really figure out how to design policy. AI is moving extraordinarily fast, so the policy level interventions need to happen fairly quickly. But all governments are on shaky ground on this subject. You probably read the Times of India article about Rishi Shanak talking about the dangers ahead. And um, you know, all smart governments like the UK and, and at the moment our government, the United States government and the Indian government are all relatively smart governments. They're all terrified. Now, if America switches to Donald Trump in the next election, that's going to be a whole different story, but for the moment, we are okay. Um, in addition, governments also need offensive and defensive AI to manage defense and homeland security. There too, hiring the best engineers is not so easy for governments. The private sector pays exorbitant sums of money to good engineers. Governments cannot compete with them. Another issue is different governments will deal with AI policy differently. Some will be really aggressive, some will be more measured. For example, once AI augmentation of humans becomes feasible, an autocratic government could create aggressive policies to force full population augmentation. A more democratic government, moderate democratic government, would go more slowly, give more freedom of choice, and, and as such, could end up falling behind in the, pay, in the race to survive. All this is going to be extremely messy. As we see over and again in history, everything is driven by the story, the narrative. The key narratives, even today, are often controlled by religion. What position, for example, would the Catholic Church take vis-a-vis -vis the issue of species level augmentation aided by AI? Would they support the move from man to Superman? Well, I would say we have to get the Catholic Church on the side of augmentation for the simple reason that they have such widespread control over what people choose to do with their lives. 
Therefore, a narrative has to be woven by the Catholic Church to justify augmentation and to endorse it and to recommend it. Hinduism is in a different situation. There is no equivalent of the Catholic Church. So how does India spin a narrative that makes augmentation acceptable to Indians? And not just the Hindus, but also the Muslims. It would be fair to assume that the autocratic states like China will make augmentation happen faster. The democracies need help from religious groups and other influential mouthpieces. And that logically brings us to political mouthpieces. In COVID, in America, we were bewildered to discover that vaccines could be a political issue. The libertarian right decided that vaccine enforcement was an encroachment on individual liberty. Science be damned. I shudder to think how we're going to enforce a much greater encroachment of individual liberty in the form of human augmentation. To conclude, Full-scale species level augmentation is possible. Humanity can be saved by upgrading itself using AI, but it is not going to be a simple process. The upcoming decades are going to be extremely messy. I've covered a lot of complex topics today. I don't know how much you have absorbed, but if I have been able to stir your thinking on these important, complex, messy issues, that is all I wanted to achieve today. I'll be happy to take questions and uh, dialogue on any of these topics. So her father has requested me to preside over uh, uh, <coughs> her speech. So it is very difficult right now. You have noted how much qualification she has attained towards explaining this AI in its, in its various issues. There are good points, good aspects where it can be uh, helping us in a major way, but there are bad areas where we must have some caution, extra caution. And in every field of our life, it is really, uh, say, entering, entering with its, AI is entering with its power, both fair and foul. So for example, uh, in medicine, in education, in economics, in social philosophy, in democracy, about socialism and communism, she made a very uh, very simple differentiation. The socialism is where there is freedom of consumption. You can consume the thing that is not produced in the country, but in communism you cannot. Production and consumption both controlled, and means of production totally. So future Ism is socialism. She has developed the idea very, very interestingly. We read it uh, quite differently in the text, but uh, she has pointed that socialism is going to be the only ism that should persist in the whole world. Why? She has given her argument in a very convincing way because uh, AI would entail huge amount of profits 
production would go on in an unlimited way and that has to be distributed evenly among the citizens and what are the processes through which we can distribute that's the good issue because i think you have omitted this question that uh, in what way ai can curb the crimes that we have been seeing very rampant in our society so financial or otherwise all crimes can ai has any chance to control that because human minds human minds are by nature selfish you know unless you teach it it cannot become tamed or conquered that's the problem and very interestingly so ai cannot produce any better dancer <laughs> so dancing you have excluded from its <coughs> as a touch so it is a process of uh, converting a man from a homo sapiens to man and man to superhuman if, if all of us become superhuman who would respect whom who is to care for whom everybody is god like that is man would be empowered in such a way that he would be he or she man means he or she he would be equated to it is a god god is omnipresent omniscient and omnipotent he, superhuman or ai would just be like that even ai can control the religious organizations because we are also functioning in the society in our own ways and we cannot stick to our own ways any further i tell you so, <clears throat> so there are bad point bad elements bad elements when you have when we have noted the good elements in it we have automatically constituted that there are some bad elements corresponding to these good ones very nice very 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 nice but i point out some of the areas where we have to be very much cautious you see just uh, i am referring to one video stunning us completely it is about the mind control bionic art with a sense of touch so it is so, so ais or the automate <coughs> the uh, artificial intelligence it is not a fantasy it is not just an abstraction it is coming to us through a machine through some machines and machines and man we have differentiated machine has no mind that's why there is no character in it a robot has no mind there is efficiency galore but there is no character in it we need character that character is missing from humanity when ai becomes so rampant that's the real problem real issue so that's why i i just give you one example this video <clears throat> what is what it is about mind control bionic art with a sense of touch it shows it you might have viewed viewed it it shows that an amputee operating her missing four arms bionic replica by merely willing and also feeling the bionic fingers touch with objects it shows we are the operators of our biological body so there is mind inside mind is mind has been set in inside the robot can it be possible we call intelligence 
why not mind why do we reject or would not assume also that mind has also a great role to play there not only intelligence alone so what happens then more so it is pertinent to pertinent now to us can feeling be manufactured with nothing to feel note it can feeling be manufactured with nothing to feel can you manufacture a superhuman three eye which has got a feeling because superhuman ai has got nothing to feel and can you produce a feeling aspect in ai with something which has nothing to feel are sensations feeling emotions all physical stuff and then what about dream memory imagination so it has come to such a pass right now that we can treat even the subtle body also with physical medicines we have come to the door steps to that in medicine further to this if the computer chips costing a penny only are set in our eyeball as contact lens then college students even with a single blink can see all the answers in their contact lens it seems that day is very near when we can download the brain net from digital internet you have been doing it are you brain net not, not yet all the euphoria and creativity and thus can buy 100% clones of our body 100% of ourselves in body mind and intellect we can clone so what would be repercussion that means i will buy myself i will buy me so this may seem very premature but not that it is a fact it is coming up in mature form and this concept is is not wrong at all anyway there are many things i could have said <coughs> the Uh, i can conclude by thanking her for her excellent speech and raising so many issues before us so we, we, we enjoyed this evening to the maximum level possible i tell her and her parents also now if i have got a standby of myself then i can i myself can treat my body with my own clone body if my heart is say or almost to say damaged then i can replace it from my own body how can i look at my own body clone body clone body concept is not at all strange right now you know that the doll doll but but it has been banned Uh, it, it is banned right now so we have to ban so many things so many things so that it cannot it cannot be possible for ai to do any harm to us only those I, those areas where its necessity is greater we can make use of this i i i feel that should be the policy of the 
Say, <coughs> heads of the nations of the world, they must sit together and find out a solution. On this aspect, each and every country's head should have, should, should come forward to make something to arrive at, something to give to the whole world. Otherwise, just like that Sivo and Brumba, they could be very much, they could be very easily appeased by the Osuros. Mm, they received boons from the Osuros, uh, uh, from the de Devotas, Sivos and Brumba, Siva and Brumba. But in turn, their created beings, their created Osuros, they being very much prominent in power, they wanted to kill their benefactors. The Shiva was in trouble. He was running. And behind him is that Osuro to kill him. Then Vishnu came forward to save Shiva. So here there is no Vishnu. Super, super God is not there. Who would save us? Everybody is running out of fear. I don't say that it is all painful. <clears throat> the wounds are there, but pains are many. And we have to become very much conscious about it. Anyway, we don't like to buy ourselves by ourselves. We don't want. We can operate upon ourselves. We ourselves can operate on our own body, our stage. So we have to take care of our own mind and intellect. Intellect. Sister, I just want to uh, know from you, why would you call it, why the scientists have called it, have called it artificial intelligence. Artificial, artificial, no, I, I, I'm, let me complete. Artificial means not real, but these robots, they are the real things coming out of real element in us, intellect. If intellect is real and anything that is produced out of this intellect must be real also. And this term real and artificial about the scientists have some aspersions against artificiality, I tell you. Not natural. Not natural. Not that. Not natural does not mean artificial. That's it coming. It is coming out of your own bed. You better call it accumulated intelligence, because well, it, uh, AI means accumulated intelligence, not artificial. This is my <laughs> suggestion. The the term is so widespread now. I don't think we can change this midstream. <laughs> We have called this world uh, unreal, artificial. The world is not real. In that sense, I tell you, that is a fact to be reckoned with. Uh, these robots, they, they are not, in that sense, artificial. Okay, fair enough. Huh? You can spread it, this idea. Karu <laughs> Prashna, Any questions from all the audience? Yes. It's a very complex question. The problem with Morajujita Bullen, problem with what do you do with characters like Vladimir Putin? AI can't do anything with characters like Vladimir Putin because these characters exist. As I said, remember in, the, in what I said, evil exists. And evil is going to do evil. Vladimir Putin exists, and other counterparts of Vladimir Putin exists, and that's why we have all this turmoil in the world. And that turmoil 
is not going anywhere. Apna Dityo Prashno? Why is there no demand? There are 10 billion people on the planet. Why is there no demand? Right? They would live in unemployment. They would be given uh, gifts only. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, in just a moment, let me just clarify this point. I mean, they have pe 10 billion people have to be fed. Their health care has to be taken care of. Their education has to be taken care of. They have to wear clothes. Everything, right? I think they will. That's a human need. I think they will. Bolan. Thank you. My pleasure. I think I've seen you before in my previous talks. A second question I'll answer first because it's a kind of like a continuation to my response to the previous person's uh, question about evil. Corruption is a form of evil. Corruption, you know, to the extent that, you know, things become automated, like distribution becomes automated. There's been, it's a very good use case that India has seen in COVID, right? The distribution of income during COVID when people did not have any income, right? There were lots of people, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people with no income during COVID who were paid digitally, with digital money. They were given money directly into their phones. Corruption could not touch that process because it was digital and it was direct. This is one of the achievements of Aadhaar. The digital you know, identification system has given us this power to cut corruption out. So there will be instances like this where corruption, by disintermediation, corruption can be cut out. Can corruption be cut out part and parcel? I doubt it. It is. I just gave you an example. Of course it is. No, but you can, you can, Marginalize them. Marginalize, uh, look at this. Look at this. No, no, but I just gave you the example. Changing human nature is a hard problem, much harder problem. But making them irrelevant, making bad people, bad actors irrelevant, is doable, right? So your other question about power grid and power production, cost of power is, you know. I mean, everybody in your sector knows that we have to go to alternative energy. We cannot stay with fossil fuels. We have to go to alternative energy, solar, wind, and so on. So, so that movement is happening. India is actually doing quite well in that movement. Sorry to interrupt you. You're mentioning the other, other types of energy production, like you, renewable energy. We all know that. But I'm, my question is, that there is a system by which the power costs are finally determined. Yes. There is electricity regulated as in all the states, and there is also one in central. For example, like power in Calcutta, for domestic, maybe 7 rupees. For industry, maybe 10 rupees. It may not be the same in Karnataka. Karnataka could be 8 rupees, could be 11 rupees. 
Maybe not. It depends on, see, I don't know the power sector as well as you do, but in all of these sectors, there is labor involved, right? Anytime you take out labor and automate that, that's going to reduce the cost because you buy a capital equipment, a robot is going to be a capital equipment, right? So the capital equipment is going to get amortized over years, right? Depreciation. So over time, the PNL is going to start to get rationalized. Yes. Sorry, Maharaj. Huge volume of unemployment. That is inevitable. We take it to That is happening. We have to assume that's happening. Bolun. Okay, I wanted to take this question actually. Mohara Jokhan Bolchila Namari Kathagulu Mathai Ashchilo. See, there is a new technology that kind of hit the market earlier this year, about February. Gotha Watcha Thike Itaniye Kaj, already it was coming into the forefront. Chat GPT, I'm sure you've read about Chat GPT. And the technology at the heart of Chat GPT is this very large language model. You know, when, when we, computers came in first, software came in first, you couldn't really interact with computers in natural language. But now, a Nutun technology is giving us the ability to talk to the computer in natural language. And the larger the language models, the more the language models have training data, the more intelligent language models are becoming. So, so currently, the language models are already extraordinarily intelligent. The, the missing piece is the one that you are bringing up and the one that Maharaj brought up is the notion of consciousness. Consciousness is not just intelligence. It is not just knowledge, it is not just information. Consciousness is also intuition, Consci consciousness is emotion, consciousness is, is a lot of different things. Spirituality, consciousness is many different factors. Those are not pure language model issues. And that, at this point, is not part of the AI that we have come up with. Is at some point is this going to become part of AI TBD? But it's not yet. Yes. Thought reading. Okay. Yeah. There is a way to avoid corruption, actually. I'll tell you how to do that. See, I talked about implants and you know, brain augmentation and all that. Brain augmentation is going to happen on, you know, it's, it's an attachment or it's an extension or augmentation of a human being. It's still a human being, even though it's a species level change, but it's, you know, it's external capabilities imposed on the general biology of a human being. Now, in the process of that input that is coming into the human mind, if philosophy comes in, if ethics comes, comes in, right, there's all kinds of input that you're, you know, a mind conditioning, a mind training can happen through that kind of artificial intelligence process as well. And that could conceivably 
tackle corruption. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Eliminating trust, no. You don't want to eliminate trust. You want to create a high trust society. The per need trust. Pardon? The need for trust. The need for trust. The need for trust is one thing which I believe we can eliminate a need for trust in the system. Okay. So there, there's a very important technology that has quite matured actually called blockchain. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that, that is one of the key technologies. Yeah. So one com quantum computers becomes a reality in the next five or ten years or the next one decade. What would be the role of quantum computers and AI coming together? The combination of quantum computing and AI is just pure speed, raw speed. So that's artificial super intelligence you're seeing. Yeah, everything that's happening in AI is going to happen at a much faster speed, both the good side and the bad side. This is a problem because cybersecurity, you know, cyber crime is very big. And cybercrime, aided by quantum computing, is going to be unmanageably big. So, um, what was your previous question? Sorry, I lost the thread. 